Uh, this is a story of an artist and her kindred spirits. About three months ago, I traveled to Bogota to meet with several Colombian artists. One of them was Beatriz Gonzalez. Beatriz's subject is Colombia's long history of civil war, corruption, and drug trafficking. Her work, in short, laments the unending violence in her beloved country. Now that day, I went to Beatrice's studio where I saw a group of simple drawings. They were based upon disturbing newspaper photographs of two men carrying corpses from a massacre. Now at first, admittedly, I didn't find those drawings of great interest owing to their obvious and overtly political nature. But then, suddenly, something struck me. Their resemblance to some of the earliest art we know of, the Lascaux cave paintings in France. They were made almost 20,000 years ago. Beatrice then took me to the Central Cemetery in Bogota to see something she had created there. In fact, it was all quite unexpected. We went to a section empty of human remains where the buildings that house them still stand. These are four Roman-style columbario, or mausoleums. Now, these mausoleums once housed the remains of over 9,000 people, many of them indigent victims of Colombia's civil war. It took Beatrice one year to cover each empty niche with one of several images that she created in the simplest pictorial language, each articulated in a primitive, almost childlike way, just as in those cave paintings. I saw repetition everywhere, four buildings, eight images, 9,000 times. I was leveled. I felt such sadness, but ironically, I felt such joy and admiration for Beatrice in one artist's voice who was speaking out against the unspeakable. We must stop this madness. So why is art relevant today? Why is it that artists still want to make pictures? Why is it that we still keep looking at them? Is there any evidence that art makes our society more civil, more humane, or our world a safer place within which to live? Now, I'm a partner in a well-established New York art gallery working with artists every day. I've had the good fortune over the course of my career to travel extensively throughout the world viewing countless exhibitions of art in museums and galleries. And while I've been exceedingly fortunate to be working in such a dynamic and creative environment, frankly, it's never been easier to get caught up in the commercialization of art. But what I'm here to talk about today is my faith in art's purpose in the world today. Have you ever wondered why a picture draws you in? Standing there with Beatrice that day, I realized why I was so moved. There was so much to process. The stark depiction of corpses, the haunting solemnity of the site, and the fact that Beatrice devoted a year of her life to the project, with Colombian suffering and dying around her. Now, Beatrice calls her memorial Auras Anonymas, or Anonymous Auras, it was meant to be temporary, but Beatrice and her friends would like it preserved. So would I. After a half century of civil war and violence, hundreds of thousands dead, millions displaced, it's far too important to be demolished. Artists paint, perform, sculpt in order to tell their stories, in order to tell our stories. They remind us not to make the same mistakes, but we do again and again. So we need repetition. That's how our brain functions. That's how we're wired. 
and we keep going back to art. Now I'd like to talk to you about a little bit more in the way of art that's relevant to Beatrice. Here is Francisco Goya's The Third of May from 1814, a painting that many of you are undoubtedly familiar with. Beatrice told me that Goya was a big influence on her, a kindred spirit in a painter who made paintings of violence. Now Goya puts it all out there in front of you, and while we can admire the dramatic rendering of light and the painterly essence and staging of scene, it's the subject, it's the story that grabs us, that grounds us, that connects us to a reality far distant from our own. Now every year I go to Madrid on business, and the first thing I do is I go to the Reina Sofia to see Picasso's Guernica. I must look at it again. The painting shows the fascist bombing of the Basque village of Guernica during the time of the Spanish Civil War. Picasso's fragmented style parallels the fragmentation of his country. It is a most lucid depiction of the horrors of war, not unlike Beatrice's Oras Anonymous. When I revisit Guernica, I bring my burden of the year's news of war and mayhem. When I stand in front of that picture, it helps me confront a reality that I am otherwise numb to. Now here is Andy Warhol's electric chair from 1963, the same year as the last execution in New York State. What you're looking at here is a tool of ritualized killing that was used over 600 times at Sing Sing Prison. Warhol used this image repeatedly over the next 10 years. Recently, I met the artist Dora Salcedo, who is a friend of Beatrice. She's a Colombian sculptor. Here's what she told me about her work. In my work, I have only addressed one issue, political violence. I have focused on political violence not because I'm Colombian, she said, but because I believe that violence defines the ethos of our society today. She went on, I believe that in art, life can transcribe a passage from suffering to signifying loss. Here is Doris's shibboleth. She cut a chasm in the floor of the Tate Modern in London. It is the most direct form of political art. We are broken, we are separated, the scar remains. More recently, I attended the opening of a mosque in Venice, the first in its historic center. Artist Christophe Bouquel transformed a deconsecrated church into a mosque. Some saw it as a welcome step, others found it a provocative one. I say bring on the debate, controversy in art is not a problem. What is a problem, however, is when money and status dominate art the language of art becomes marginalized. Now it's ironical, I'm a part of that system, running a gallery, representing successful artists, but I see trouble ahead in the commodification of culture. Our diminishing attention span separates us from the art. Art, its language, is in danger of being subsumed by its entertainment value, by its asset value. A lot of art is being bought and sold without much interest, if any, in what the artists are saying. We should be happy that our museums are busy, that they're crowded. The Museum of Modern Art last year had three million visitors. The Tate in London, five million visitors. But we needn't be happy about the way our experience of art has been compromised when you can't stand in front of a painting quietly, something is lost. Our sanctuary is gone. Art demands 
time, and attention. So we must slow down. Receiving is quiet. Art is quiet. It's internal. Some paintings offer us beauty and solace. Others, more challenging work, pushes us to confront reality, to let go of our preconceptions, to let ideas take new place. The idea behind the discovery of art is something that is very special. Art beckons us past our boundaries of race, class, gender, nationality. It beckons us past our limitations of intolerance and apathy. Now, like anyone, I make the same mistakes over and over. And the truth is that what I come to realize, finally, at the end of the day, artists and art is relevant today. It's entirely essential because artists help us look squarely into human failure. There is no averting our eyes when the work is compelling. In 1963, President Kennedy eulogized the late American poet, Robert Frost, and I will read you that eulogy. He brought an instinct for reality to bear upon the pieties and platitudes of society. His sense of human tragedy fortified him against self-deception and easy consolation. The artist becomes the champion of the individual mind and sensibility against an intrusive state and an officious society. In pursuing his perceptions of reality, the artist must sail against the currents of his time. This is not a popular role. Not everyone in Bogota wants Beatrice's memorial to be preserved, but it really doesn't matter. She's delivered her message. Standing in front of it for me, my self-deception and easy consolation fell away. So to all of you, I say sail on against the current of our time. Let artists and their work navigate the waters ahead for you. Thank you very much.